Loving your enemy is one of the most radical and challenging exhortations ever proposed by Jesus to his followers. This commandment on the ground challenges human logic, but it also overthrows all known religious and philosophical paradigms. How can we love someone who hurts us? What does this teaching really mean and why is it so powerful? Is it possible to love our enemies? In this video, we will delve deeper into the revolutionary meaning of loving our enemies. We will see concrete examples of how love for enemies has transformed conflicts, promoted peace and generated significant changes in the lives of people. Before continuing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new content. Let's get started. A man committed horrendous crimes against innocent young people, causing terror in the community. Finally, he was captured and brought to justice. All the priests of the victims, overwhelmed by the pain and the loss, were present, including a priest who followed the path of Christianity. When he took his turn to speak, the Christian priest stood up with a serenity that contrasted with the intense emotion in the room. Looking directly at the accused, whose acts destroyed so many lives, the priest spoke with a firm voice but full of compassion. Today you have to test my faith. Despite the immense pain for the loss of my daughter, I want to say that I forgive you. I wish no harm for you. The priest's forgiveness filled the room with a dense silence, while other priests cried out for justice with a mixture of anger and sadness. At that moment, the gesture of the Christian priest on the ground defied human expectations, a bell that revealed a compassion that seemed to transcend the earthly, inspired by a love that knew no limits of the love of God. Dear listener, this man deeply understood the true meaning of loving your enemy genuinely and deeply. Now, allow me to ask you, have you learned to love your enemy? The mandate to love your enemies, which is found as part of the Sermon on the Mount recorded in the Evangel of Matthew chapter 5, which marks a culminating point in profound contrast with the justice taught by scribes and Pharisees. This passage subtracts the radical difference between the ethics of the kingdom of heaven and the conventional norms of their time. Let's read verse 43 of chapter 5 of Matthew. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The Jewish scholar Claude Joseph Goldsmith Montefiore refers to this part as the central and most famous section of the Sermon on the Mount. There is no doubt that there is no other passage in the New Testament that presents Christian ethics regarding personal relationships in such a concentrated way. For any average person, this passage represents essential Christianity in action. Even those who never set foot in a church know that Jesus said these words and often criticize practicing Christians for not living up to his demands. It should be noted that the Old Testament did not explicitly teach to hate one's enemies, although it did establish the commandment to love one's neighbor. The doctrine of hating enemies comes from the interpretation and application that the scribes and Pharisees made of the laws of the Old Testament. Why then did the Jews have so much hatred? There were several significant factors that contributed to the attitude of the Israelites toward other nations. First, the Israelites were ordered to mercilessly destroy the Canaanites and all their objects of worship. Second, they were prohibited from forming alliances with them. This clearly indicates that there could never be peace between Israel and the pagan nations. This was necessary to separate them and prevent Israel from being contaminated by her abominations. Third, hating God's enemies was considered a pious emotion as expressed by the psalmist in Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22. Do I not hate, O Lord, those who hate you, and am I enraged against your enemies? I absolutely hate them. I consider them enemies. An unnecessary consequence of Jewish separatism was a vain concept of being much more pious than other men, which led them to despise and hate others. For example, the Jews did not treat the Samaritans well because they were not considered true Jews, but rather a mixed race. They also disliked the Romans. The Jews hated the Romans because they were the conquerors of their land and they demanded taxes. 
Likewise, the publicans, who were collectors of Roman taxes, were despised and hated by the people, as they were considered traitors. Consequently, the national attitude was one of abhorrence toward enemies. Jesus sought to correct this problem of hate. Let's continue reading verse 44 of chapter 5 of Matthew. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus introduced a new teaching, one not found anywhere in the Old Testament. With that authority, he could establish new commandments, which shows that Jesus, as sent by the Father, had all these powers. Often the prophets would say, Thus says the Lord. But Jesus would say, But I tell you, this shows us his faculty as the Son of God. Jesus reminds them that God means that all people are our neighbors, even our enemies. The law of Moses said, You shall love your neighbor, People already knew and used the word love, but their concept of love was very limited. Jesus gives a new meaning to the word. But what kind of love was the Lord referring to? The word love in Greek is agap, with the corresponding verb agapan to love. These words indicate an unconquerable benevolence, an invincible goodwill. Agape is the word used here. If we look at a person with agap, this means that it does not matter what that person does to us or how they treat us. It doesn't matter if he insults, insults, or offends us. We will not allow any bitterness to invade our hearts against her, but we will continue to look at her with that unconquerable benevolence and goodwill that will only seek her supreme good. Some things come from here. Jesus has never asked us to love our enemies in the same way we love our intimates and loved ones. The same word is already different. Loving our enemies the same way we love our family would not be possible or fair. This is a different kind of love. Where is the difference? In the case of our family members, we cannot help but love them. We talk about falling in love. It is something that happens to us without looking for it. It is something that is born from the emotions of the heart. But in the case of our enemies, love is not something only of the heart. It is also something of the will. It is not something we cannot avoid. It is something we have to encourage ourselves to do. It is, in fact, a victory over what happens instinctively to the natural man. Agape does not mean a feeling of the heart, which we cannot avoid, and which happens to us without wanting it or seeking it. It means a decision of the mind, through which we achieve this unconquerable goodwill, even for those who harm or offend us. Agape, someone has said, is the power to love those we don't like and those we don't like. In fact, we can only have agape when Jesus Christ allows us to conquer our natural tendency toward anger and resentment and achieve this invincible goodwill toward everyone. It should be noted that Jesus established this love as the basis for personal relationships. People use this passage as a basis for pacifism and as a text regarding international relations. Of course, it includes everything, but first and foremost, it refers to our personal relationships with our family and with our neighbors and with the people we encounter in our daily lives. We must note that this commandment is only possible for a Christian. Only the grace of Jesus Christ can enable a person to have this unconquerable benevolence and this invincible goodwill in his personal relationships with others. Only when Christ lives in our hearts does bitterness die and this love of life springs forth. It is often said that this world would be perfect if only people lived according to the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. But the simple fact is that no one can even begin to live by these principles without the help of Jesus Christ. We need Christ to enable us to obey Christ's commandment. Finally, and this may be the most important of all, we must note that this commandment not only does not mean letting people do whatever they want with us, it also implies that we must do something for them. To comply with this law, we are ordered. First, bless our enemies. It is often natural to bless our friends. We want them to do very well. However, when it comes to enemies, people often despise them, insult them, speak ill of them, and wish them the worst. However, a Christian, even though he is tempted to curse his enemy, blesses him and wishes him well even if the enemy wishes the worst for him. 
Second, we are commanded to do good to those who hate us. To this we can add what the Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing this you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be defeated by evil, but overcome evil with good. Christianity goes beyond non-resistance to active benevolence. He does not destroy his enemies by violence, but converts them by love. Feed your enemy when he is hungry and satisfy his thirst. By doing this, you will heap embers of fire on his head. It refers to an ancient Egyptian custom in which a person who wanted to show public contrition would place a frying pan with burning coals on his head. This represented the burning pain of his shame and guilt. If believers help their enemies with love, this will bring shame to them because of their hatred and hostility. Third, we are commanded to pray for them. No one can pray for another person and still hate them. When you come before God with the other person you are tempted to hate, something happens. We cannot continue to hate anyone in the presence of God. The most effective way to end bitterness is to pray for the person we are tempted to hate. Dear listener, let me ask you, have you been doing this? What has been your reaction to those who wish you harm and make your life impossible? Jesus understood that we will have enemies, but we must respond to them with love, trusting that God will protect our cause and destroy our enemies in the best way possible, transforming them into our friends. The disciples' attitude toward religious persecution must go beyond non-retaliation to positive love. Let's continue reading verse 45 of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven, who makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. We have already understood what Jesus meant when he commanded us to have this Christian love. Now we must consider, why then does Jesus demand that a person possess this love, this unconquerable benevolence, and this invincible goodwill? The reason is very simple and profound. This love makes the person look like God. Jesus pointed out God's action in the world, which is unconquerable benevolence. God causes His Son to rise on the good and the bad. He sends His reign on the just and the unjust. Rabbi Yoshua ben Nehemiah used to say, have you noticed that the rain falls on the field of A, which is fair, and not on the field of B, which is unfair? Or may the sun rise and shine on Israel, which is righteous, and not on the Gentiles, who are wicked? God makes His sun shine both on Israel and on the nations, because the Lord is good to all. Even this Jewish rabbi was moved and impressed by the benevolence of God, both with saints and sinners. Jesus says we must have this love to become children of our Father who is in heaven. Hebrew is not rich in adjectives. For that reason, son of is often used with an abstract noun where we would use an adjective. For example, a child of peace is a peaceful person. A son of consolation is a comforting man. So a child of God is a man who looks like God. The reason we must have this unconquerable benevolence and goodwill is that God has them. And if we have them, we become nothing less than children of God, people who look like God. Let's continue reading verse 46 of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't publicans also do the same? Who was the neighbor for a Pharisee? For them, the neighbor was another Pharisee. Who did the Pharisee love? To another Pharisee? Who did a Jew love? To another Jew who loved him. Likewise, for us, loving those who love us is something natural and common. This kind of love is effortless and particularly admirable, for even sinners and those without faith love those who love them. But what is so surprising about this type of love? Actually, there is nothing special about it since it is a universal behavior. All human beings, regardless of their morality or beliefs, tend to love those who show them affection and kindness. This love is conditional and based on reciprocity. However, Christian love goes far beyond these limitations. Jesus calls us to a love that breaks down these barriers, a love that is capable of extending even to our enemies. This love is not based on what we receive in return, 
but on unconquerable benevolence and goodwill. It is a love that reflects the nature of God, who makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, and makes it rain on the just and the unjust. This Christian love is radical and transformative because it challenges us to love unconditionally, to wish the highest good even for those who wish us harm, and to act with kindness and mercy in all circumstances. It is this love that makes us like God and fulfills Jesus' commandment to love our enemies. Let's continue reading verse 47. And if you greet only your brothers, what do you do more? Don't the Gentiles also do this? The universal Near Eastern greeting Shalom or Salam, peace, expresses the wish that the one to whom the greeting is addressed may enjoy every spiritual and material blessing. If we only greet our brothers as the religious leaders did, there is nothing meritorious or worthy of special mention in doing what everyone else does. Finally, let's read verse 48 of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Here we have the key to one of the most difficult phrases in the New Testament, the phrase with which this passage ends. Jesus said, Therefore you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. At first glance, this sounds like a commandment that cannot possibly refer to us. There is no one who considers that we can even come close to God's perfection. The Greek word for perfect is teleos. This word is often used in Greek in a very special sense. It has nothing to do with what we could call abstract or metaphysical perfection. A victim who is suitable for sacrifice to God, who has no defect, is teleos. A man who has reached his full height is teleos, as opposed to a boy who is growing. A student who has achieved mature knowledge of his subject is teleos, as opposed to another who has only just begun and has not yet sufficiently grasped the ideas. To put it another way, the Greek idea of perfection is functional. A thing is perfect if it fully fulfills the purpose for which it was intended, designed, and made. In fact, that sense is implied in the derivatives of this word. Teleos is the adjective that is formed from the noun telos. Telos means end, purpose, objective, goal. A thing is teleos if it fulfills the purpose for which it was planned. A person is perfect if he fulfills the purpose for which he was created. Or what purpose was the human person created? The Bible leaves us in no doubt about this. In the ancient story of creation, we find God saying, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Man was created to resemble God. The characteristic of God is this universal benevolence, this unconquerable goodwill, this constant search for the supreme good of each creature. The great characteristic of God is His love for saint and sinner alike. It doesn't matter what men do to him. God seeks nothing but his highest good. That's what we see in Jesus. When tireless benevolence is reproduced in a person's life, that person resembles God and is therefore perfect in the New Testament sense of the word. To put it even more simply, the person who cares the most about others will be the most perfect person. The teaching of the Bible is unanimous in saying that we realize our humanity only by resembling God. The only thing that makes us similar to God is the love that never stops caring for men, no matter what they do to it. We realize our humanity, we achieve Christian perfection, when we learn to forgive as God forgives, and to love as God loves. In conclusion, the command to love our enemies represents a radical and transformative challenge in the teaching of Jesus. This call goes beyond the limits of the conditional and natural love that we offer to those who love us. Loving our enemies implies an inner disposition of benevolence and unconquerable goodwill, which seeks the highest good even for those who harm us. This type of love is not common or easy to practice, but it reflects the very nature of God, who shows His love indiscriminately. It is through this love that we draw closer to the divine image and fulfill the mandate to follow the example of Christ in all our human relationships. Thank you very much for joining us in this reflection. God bless you.